podcast where we, a real-life mother and daughter duo, rewatch Gilmore Girls and discuss the misadventures of fictional mother and daughter duo Lorelai and Rory Gilmore. I am Tessa Dare, a writer and the author of the paranormal mystery series The Corrounds and Chronicles, and I am Beth's daughter. And I'm Beth, Tessa's mom. I'm also a writer. Tess and I have been talking about movies, TV, music, politics, and culture pretty much since she could read. Even after she moved to Seattle, for which I have never really forgiven her, we kept up this dialogue until one day one of us joked we should do a podcast and move these talks into the digital world. The Gilmore Girls seem like a good place to start because not only does their story resonate with us, I was a single mother of a teenage daughter attending a private school we could not afford, but the plot lines in the Gilmore Girls often embrace the topics that Tess and I like to discuss. So here we are. Every week, we will start off with a synopsis of the episode, along with the date it aired before heading into our discussion. Uh, and we also start off with a little bit of uh, coffee talk. Yes, we do. I am, boy, I think I did that thing again where I drank like half of a coffee and then refilled. And this one, what I am drinking right now is a homemade dupe of the Starbucks uh, pumpkin spice latte. <laughs> That there's a I found a recipe online for the sauce that goes into it. it this is not technically a latte. I just added it to my regular coffee. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do not get the pumpkin thing, but I think that's the thing. You know, that it's, it's black and white. People either love it or hate it. Mm-hmm. I'm in the hate group, <laughs> and I've had three cups of coffee today during lunch with friends, so I'm good. <laughs> I've had enough. And today, <laughs> today we are discussing season one, episode nine which originally aired December 20th, 2000. And it's called Rory's Dance. Uh, The episode overview is basically Rory goes to a dance uh, with Dean, but accidentally stays out all night and drama ensues. Which reminded me of the song, Everly Brothers. Wake up, little Susie, I think it is. Then they fall asleep in a movie theater. Yeah, yeah. So maybe maybe that should be (laughs) our intro music for this episode. (laughs) Uh, Maybe that was the inspiration for this episode. And maybe it was, yeah. (laughs) Um, So we start with the cold open. Um, This is another, we've had a couple episodes now where where Grandpa Richard has not been there. But Emily has. And I wonder if that's because the actor was in demand. He was Maybe. doing a lot of other stuff. and yeah. It could be. You know, I feel, I, but I feel like it works. Like, that That definitely could be why. But I feel like it works because it is the Gilmore Girls. And, like, he, yes. he is a part of the family. But in many ways, I feel like, I mean, Emily is just, like, a much more complicated character. And her dynamic with the other two is just, like, super complicated (laughs) like grandpa richard i like him but he is kind of a simple guy he likes to work and he likes to be kind of you know a he doesn't literally smoke a pipe but he just likes to be that sort of old-timey guy um and he has he has moments of complication but i feel like emily overall especially in this episode (laughs) is uh, a much more complicated person (laughs) Well, and I wonder too. I would love to know how much the the creator, the the writer, Amy Sherman uh, of, this, of the series, yeah, how much she thought about when, when she decided to call this the Gilmore Girls. If she had Emily in mind as one of the Gilmore Girls, or if it kind of evolved. Yeah. And but but I have thought since the beginning that Emily was one of the Gilmore Girls. That yeah. She was the three of them. This is their three of theirs. Uh, the, the story of the three of them. Yeah. And not ju- not just mom and daughter, but grandma too. So yeah. I've thought that from the beginning but i wonder if the creator intended it that way yeah i mean yeah that's definitely how i feel and i I don't know but yeah so in this scene richard is in Prague, and he is going to bring rory back something and emily talks a little bit about how cool Prague is basically with the castles everywhere but rory is excited because the quote-unquote the cell that vaklav havel was held in is now a hostel which I, <laughs> I do feel like if that line were written today, it would be that it's now an Airbnb. Um, yeah. But yeah, so Vaclav Havel was a Czech... St- I had to look this up. <laughs> he was a Czech statesman, author, poet, playwright, and former dissident. This is straight up his Wikipedia bio. 
He served as the last president of Czechoslovakia from 1989 until the dissolution of Czechoslovakia in 1992, and then as the first president of the Czech Republic from 1993 to 2003, and was the first democratically elected president of either country after the fall of communism. Wow. You did your homework. <laughs> yeah, I, That's literally um, all just his first <laughs> paragraph on Wikipedia. Well, and the only comment I have on Prague is that the only person I have ever known who's gone to Prague, who's visited Prague, is my friend Lori, with whom I had lunch today. Mm. And, and I thought it was odd at the time when she told me that, you know, one of the few places, uh, one of the places she's traveled to in her youth was Prague. And all I could think <laughs> was, why the hell would anybody go to Prague but but that's Lori I mean yeah. and she and she loved it she's this beautiful city it's historic uh and she I think she went there in her 20s so mm. it might have still been communist controlled I don't know so that's my only comment about Prague yeah I mean my I was mainly curious because this felt like a very classic Rory moment and also honestly kind of a classic teenage moment when you know when you're a teenager and you're learning all of this stuff and you're just like full of facts that you're super excited about and whenever anyone mentions something that is close to a fact that you know you just sort of shout it out at them this this felt like one of those moments oh Vaclav yeah. Havel was held in this cell that's now a hostel that felt very like oh yeah teenage nerd right there I, I wonder if it's a, if it's not so much a teenage thing it's just a nerd just thing a nerd in general thing. because you were maybe nine or ten years old when, when we were visiting my aunt and uncle one time we were watching the weather you may not remember this but they they said it was going to snow but temperatures were going to go up mm, mm-hmm. and I, I said that is doesn't make any sense and you jumped right in and said oh yeah and this is why and I can't remember the reason yeah you it's knew the reason why it's something because the process that forms the when precipitation forms into snow it actually releases heat I think there is what you it go is. Miss, Miss Nerd <laughs> I mean, and there we have the, the Tess Rory connection all over again. So, yeah, I think this um, is also why I watch a lot of Hank Green YouTube content now. <laughs> anyway. But on to the real issue here, yes. which is the dance. They talk about the dance, and apparently uh, Emily knows that there's a dance, but Lorelai doesn't know that there's mm-hmm. a dance. And then so they talk about it. And the, the fun thing about this scene for me was Rory isn't sure she wants to go. And, of course, we all know who Rory is, and we know instantly why she doesn't want to go to the dance. She yeah. really does want to go. But there are some things she's afraid of. And so Lorelai jumps in and defends her, and Emily gets mad and gets her, you know, she wants her to go because to her, this is a society thing, and you should go. But Lorelai defends Rory until they get out to the car. Yeah. And then she says, starts in, and why don't you want to go? Yeah. Why don't you want to go? And then, of course, they hash through her fears. Yeah. And that is, I am getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but uh, but I just thought this was a fascinating scene with the dynamic between these three women. Yeah, and actually, now that you're mentioning it, I think it kind of foreshadows what happens at the end of this episode. Yes, it absolutely does. Where Lorelai defends Rory and then kind of jumps all over her. But yeah, the there were a couple of lines of dialogue that struck out to me. Uh, so Lorelai and Emily have this sort of back and forth, and this also kind of sets up one of the conflicts of, the, of this episode, which is Emily and Lorelai's different parenting styles. Yeah. You know, that's also a conflict throughout the series, but that's definitely one of the highlighted conflicts of this episode where, you know, Emily, like, first of all, Lorelai doesn't even know that Emily gets the Chilton newsletter and is kind of, like, taken aback by that, whereas Emily, on the other hand, is both offended by the fact that Lorelai definitely doesn't read it and also immediately assumes that Lorelai doesn't read it. (laughs) And Lorelai tries to pretend that she does, but it's pretty because clear she that she does daughter. She yeah. knows her daughter. And, you know, Lola's not going to read the, the, the society pages. She also has know, a busy life. Says. Like and she has she, a busy life, yeah. You know, yeah. I, I love Emily, but Emily does not actually have a job. Her job is kind of this sort of stuff. Her, her job is these yes. sort of, like, as she sees them, society functions. Lorelai has a different job that doesn't involve doing all of this. And yeah, like she knows that if it was something that was important to Rory, Rory would bring it up to her. Also, one of my favorite lines of Lorelai's in this scene is Emily accuses her of not knowing that they were taking donations to like save some owl species. And Lorelai responds, it's a private school. They're always taking donations. 
and and but she does. I think Emily gets the upper hand on that argument because she makes the point that you know if you if you're not reading this and you don't know what kinds of great causes there, she actually makes she makes some good arguments in this in this scene. Not, yeah, however, about the dance. Yeah, true. Uh, and yeah, one of their exchanges about that is Emily saying, "Well, I don't understand why she wouldn't want to go." And Lorelai says, "I know you don't," uh, mm-hmm. which is kind of yeah the whole the whole thing. Uh, and even though Lorelai does kind of turn around and ask Rory very similar questions her tone is much less accusatory she's also under she also understands her daughter yeah and she kind of she kind of already knows what the answer is when she asks the question yeah uh when they get out to the car and she she's discussing it with her and, and roy gets starts to get a little defensive just like she had with her grandmother yeah but lorelei uses a much more logical argument yeah and and then she gets into what are you afraid of what exactly are you afraid of and before we go on with that discussion i just want to point out a production note here Mm -hmm. that I have in in my uh, in my notes it's actually dark in the car while they're driving which I think most tv shows and movies don't get right yeah you know, it's almost it's there they li- they lit light them so that it's so well lit that it looks like daytime but but this is they're driving at night and they only look lit when we see the headlights from yeah. oncoming traffic hit them in the face that's a very realistic production yeah I, I i i wish we saw that more often in tvs and it's like they can't be bothered to get that right you know yeah. cars when you're driving at night they're dark yeah you know you can barely see yourself my usual big pet peeve about driving scenes is having people have super involved conversations and having the driver fully look away from the road for oh, yeah. minutes at a time <laughs> just to yes. have this conversation. And I'm just like, oh my God, don't do that. Uh, anyway, but yeah, Lorelai, uh, I, I think Lorelai kind of gets to the heart of the matter um, by saying that she doesn't want Rory to miss out because she's scared. Uh, yeah. And that's that's a good point. You know, it's, it's one thing to genuinely not want to go. It's a different thing to be reluctant to go because you're afraid of how it will turn out. I think... Lorelai, I, I think Lorelai has correctly cottoned on to the fact that a lot of Rory's, Rory is very confident in school and in other things that don't have to do with specifically either boys and romantic situations or figuring out the social life at Chilton. Yes, and you know, what I was thinking about as I was watching this scene is that she still doesn't feel liked at school. She doesn't feel like she fits in. She entered this school in her junior year and not even on the first day of her junior year but a month into school yeah she didn't enter in her in her freshman year the way everybody else did or if it's a six-year prep school in seventh grade these people have all known each other a long time and she is struggling to fit in yeah and she's really only going to be there for like a year and a half so how much fitting in does she really have to do is one question that she may be asking herself although she doesn't say it on screen but the question i would be asking you know how much so anyway we know what the real reason reason is that she's afraid um Lorelai gets all the reasons she has to ask Dean to go with her she's worried about him saying no she's worried about going to a dance with kids who haven't accepted her yet dancing in public Mm -hmm. (laughs) all the reasons the thing that she doesn't say openly in this scene is that you know she's the main two people that she interacts with at school are both horrible to her in different ways. And we will see that play out for the rest of this oh, episode. Oh, yeah. This is the episode where that mm-hmm. is the most most painstakingly obvious. Yeah. And all of this happens before the credits. Yeah. And the question that I put in my notes then is, are you still, we are at episode nine, is that right? Mm-hmm. Are you are you, are you still watching the interim credits or are you fast forwarding through them? It kind of depends. I did skip them last night. Uh, it's kind of like every other time. I watch them every other time, basically. I love the music and the credit, the opening scene so much, and I am still watching it all the way through. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there. Uh, all right, so the next scene is Rory and Lane walking around. Surprise, they're still talking about Rory's problems. This whole scene is about Rory. I've noticed it, and I'm not going to stop talking about it. But that being said, I do like this exchange between them. And so Rory is basically, at this point, the thing that she's stressing out about is she's afraid of asking Dean out, basically. Even though Mm -hmm. they are already dating, she doesn't quite know where they stand. And she isn't sure. I mean, she's, you know, she's never had to ask a boy to go with her to a dance before. So even though they have this relationship, she doesn't know for sure that he's going to say yes. And she's very nervous about it. Uh, Lane, on the other hand, basically wants her to go and ask ask him immediately because she's bored because (laughs) her mom 
threw away her television or their television when she caught Lane watching VIP, which I also looked up and it was a TV show that lasted for about four seasons starring Pamela Anderson. And I'm going to be honest, I'm on Mrs. Kim's side. I don't know why Lane was watching this show. It sounds very bad. It, it was it was like the premise of it is that Pamela Anderson's character doesn't know anything about bodyguarding but ends up working with this bodyguard organization and every episode her lack of knowledge about what she's doing saves the person that they're trying to protect. Well, it's not like people are tuning in to watch the storyline. They were uh, yeah. tuning in to watch her. Yeah. I'm just like, they couldn't come up with a, a premise for this show that wasn't, this woman is so stupid, she always saves the day. Because that's what the premise yeah. of this show is. The premise is her, really stupid. her incompetence saves the day every time. So anyway. Well, isn't, she, isn't she, she was Baywatch, right? Yeah, that's she was in Baywatch. Is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay, so in this scene also, um, one of the things that I think, the thing, she's not just getting back to her asking Dean out on a date. It's not just a date. It's a date to a dance, which is about as artificial a setting or construct as you can imagine for a first date. Mm-hmm. So they really, they've had some time together. They've kissed. They've talked. They've walked. They've held hands. But they haven't actually even gone to the, well, I guess they did go to a movie, though. They did go to a movie. But that's been pretty much it. And now she's going to take them to a very artificial setting. Yeah. Which is, you know, artificial social situation. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's a worse kind of date, especially early. She also does have reason to believe that he might not want to go because he has even sure. less reason to want to be there than she does. He doesn't know any yes. of those people. Yeah, so what she's asking him to do is support her. Yeah. Is the relationship strong enough at this point that she can ask that? Yeah. Are they in a place where she can ask that? That's what she's wondering, you know? Yeah. And so this is sort of the fact that this dance is happening is sort of forcing her to question what they are. But she hasn't yeah. she hasn't quite formulated that into a question yet. That happens later in the episode. So Rory does go into the market uh, where Dean is working uh, and basically asks him as indirectly as possible. Oh, it was so painful to watch that scene. And yet yeah. it was also adorable. I mean, it was cute. But she she hems and haws and gets around it. and She's really and, struggling yeah. to get it out, yeah. And she and he basically asks himself, you know, yeah. He's, so are you are you asking me to go with you? Yeah, are you and asking? He me says, to... Well, only if you want to. Well, well, no, I don't want to. Well, specifically, he's her response is no, yes, <laughs> <laughs> which is exactly what you expect her to say. Yeah, um, yeah, and Dean is hesitant. Uh, he says he's never gone to a dance before because he's not a joiner, um, which mm. I guess that's a valid reason i don't know it it doesn't feel like that's really it it feels a little bit more like this is just sort of your standard boy doesn't want to do girly thing that's kind of what this reads as to me and he's definitely a macho guy Mm -hmm. we get that that comes up again at the dance he's definitely he could play football he's tall Mm -hmm. you know he's he's got the whole macho he's got george clooney good looks that kind of thing you know he's he definitely doesn't have to do this. So he's having her hemming and hawing is that's giving him a few seconds to work through in his own yeah. mind, I think. Can I do this for her? Because this is what, you know, I don't want to go. I'd mm-hmm. be going for her. Yeah. And also to his credit, he basically is like reading her expressions. And when he sees that she is disappointed by him mm-hmm. possibly saying no, he turns around and says yes. He's 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 yeah. ready to do this. He's basically, I think, trying to gauge if she actually wants to go and like how, how deep that desire is. And if she does want to go, then he will go with her. Based on my ancient memories of high school and, and teenage years i would say that's pretty realistic you know being nervous about asking somebody going mm-hmm. back and forth and trying to make the case i think there was one time that i wanted to go to a dance and i wanted my boyfriend to go with me and i didn't have the nerve to ask him so mm-hmm. and he was he was that kind of guy he wouldn't have wanted to go so so yeah i get this completely yeah i mean yeah i think it you know i, th- I think some boys are definitely not interested in this kind of thing but some boys are i mean the the dances that we had at my school most of us didn't have dates uh we just kind of went together and my male friends were 
just as into it as my female friends were, in part because at my school, my school was so small that we actually, when we first went, we did not have a prom. Uh, and we, uh, there were, it was actually a movement by the student body to institute a prom. And I was actually technically a part of that. Uh, it, it wasn't like my personal drive to do it, but basically the guy who really wanted to start the prom created a prom committee out of the pre-existing student council representatives and I happened to be that at the time so I was on the prom committee uh and everyone was really into it like this was one of the few things that our student body managed to really successfully pull off and I believe it is still going to this day uh and that's, that's great that's because both boys and girls wanted to have a prom we wanted to feel like we were normal teens well and the thing about your school it was it was very very small very small but there also was not a lot of dating going yeah. on there was a little mm -hmm. but not a lot and so it was a group effort and, yeah. and everybody went together um so it, yeah it was a it's a very different high school experience you had yeah it, it was definitely it was i would say it was a different kind of thing than it probably is for most high schoolers granted i'm uh, I do not know whereof I speak. I, I did not go to a normal high school, so yeah, I don't right, really right. know what this is like. But the way that you're, I've you're seen now it... now it's just TV now. Like yeah, the, the, TV. exactly. The way that I've seen it in television, it seems like the prom is usually a romantic thing. It was not really a romantic thing for most of us at my school. There were maybe two or three established couples Everyone else was just there to have a good time. We, 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 we just went to dance and have fun and, and have a night where we dressed up. My school had, uh, my class had 500 students. Mm. So, yeah, very different. And it was more of a kind of a, a mini wedding approach. I mean, it, mm. it, it, people, girls and, and, and I guess uh, boys too approached it in that manner. You know, your brother went. He went to a public school. And he, yes. He went to his prom. So that's, that's also my experience because I didn't go to prom, but he did. Yeah. And, you know, getting a tux, which is what you do for a wedding. It, it, the whole process kind of reminded me of uh, a mini wedding. The girls have to have really nice dresses and you get them flowers and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Uh, all right. So getting back to the episode. Get back uh, on topic here. So Dean does <laughs> agree. And then we get to the next scene, which in my opinion is maybe the most relatable scene of this whole episode uh Lorelai gets tackled by her own mannequin and immediately injures herself because she is making a dress yes. for her daughter instead of buying one yes and the only comment I had on, on that is that there was so much tool in that room yeah that and and again here's that word that nobody tool. knows for sure that we're pronouncing correctly but it keeps coming up in the girl in the Gilmore Girls tool is like a meshy fabric mm -hmm. and it's been Oh, they've used it so many times, but here it is. She and she doesn't even. Oh, I guess she does end up using it because it's yeah. the underskirt, not the. Because I'm, I'm thinking, where's she, where's she going to put this tool? But it's the underskirt that makes the dress kind of Fluffy. go out, Scarlett O'Hara style, you know? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, she's she's making Rory's dress. Uh, we don't see it in its final form really until Rory puts it on, and it looks handmade to me. I, you know. There are there are pieces to it like the neckline that looks a little like it hasn't been ironed. It does look like uh, it hasn't been know, ironed, which bothers me a little bit because they could yeah. have ironed it. <laughs> well, I think they were trying to make the point that it was yeah. homemade, and it is a fancy school, so you know, parents they probably spend hundreds of, and this is twenty years ago, mm -hmm. hundreds of dollars on a dress, and she's making her daughter a dress, Although, which her daughter embraces. Rory loves it. Yeah, Rory loves it. Also, I'm just gonna go ahead and say it. I think she has the best dress at the party she did she did have the best and dress also i i think you are right but the dresses that we see these girls wearing are not dresses that would cost that much money and we can get into it in a mm. second when we get there but like i don't know Let, let's talk about the fashion in a moment <laughs> okay All um right. but yeah so lorelei hurts herself uh suki shows up with thread and also reveals that she has an entire to go pharmacy in her purse because she immediately sees <laughs> that Lorelai is uh, not, injured. Not just a, not just a pharmacy, but an illegal drug. An pharmacy. Illegal, yeah, we <laughs> basically see some opioids. Yeah, these are, this is like an illegal drug exchange. She is absolutely not yeah. supposed to be doing this. I, and they may not be illegal. They may all be prescription. And they are they are all prescription drugs, but there's a lot of them. She's got a lot yeah. of different kinds. Also, and she's so all she's, I can think of is what kind of well, she's 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 such a. Um, She's a clusterfuck of yeah. accidents. I mean, she is constantly having accidents. So, of uh -huh. course, she has 
all of these drugs to yeah. to take care of her when when she hurts herself, which is all the time. Mm-hmm. But the illegal part is she's sharing one of these prescriptions with Lorelai. That's the illegal part. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it is. And, and at least it's just a muscle relaxer. But boy, muscle relaxers can put you to sleep. They can. So yes. <laughs> yeah, I was actually I was expecting that to have more of a payoff. I was kind of expecting Lorelai to end up like fully passed out or something at some point. She does eventually, but she, not, she not does, first, but it doesn't yeah. really it, and it doesn't really matter to the plot. Um, mm-hmm. So I guess yeah. I was expecting more of a sitcom plot to come of uh, yeah. this moment. Well, she gets drowsy and droopy and loopy and yeah, yeah, yeah but that, that didn't really happen. happen. In uh, fact, but, she has a conversation with her mom who yes. wants to come over and take pictures and I want to pick take her on the stairs. I want to take pictures of her at the door. Mm-hmm. And my question about this is she invites her mom over and uh, Emily says, I'll see you at 7. And my thought was, isn't that late for a dance? Do they start after 7? I mean, don't they usually start like by 6.30? So I don't know. It seemed late. Boy, I don't know. It's been a very long time. <laughs> yeah, well, me too. <laughs> I, I feel like they might start at 8. It does, it does feel a little bit late, but I also don't really know. Uh, I did want to say <laughs> that when Lorelai hurt herself working on a sewing project, that was a very real moment for me. I literally currently have a mild hip injury from when I was working on a skirt I was trying to make. Oh. So I was just like, oh, okay, I have come full circle. I am completely Lorelai now. <laughs> Yes. Um, but yeah, so uh, so yeah, uh, Emily does call and ask to come over. She, well, actually, specifically what she does is she keeps asking Lorelai to take more pictures until Lorelai invites her to come over. Yes. And then she does mention that she's making the dress, and Emily responds with, you're not using the curtains, are you? Yeah. <laughs> Which is a reference, by the way, yes. that everybody on the freaking planet gets. Yes. I just want to say. <laughs> yeah, I don't think we even have to go into it. I just wanted to no. call out the line. But yeah, so and so she does get invited and apparently comes over at seven. <laughs> well, and then before she comes over, there's a short scene yeah. where Rory is buying her ticket. Yeah, my and... my first note on this is, oh God, Tristan is back. <laughs> Tristan is back, but I think Rory successfully puts Tristan in his place in this mm-hmm. about, you know, the guy buying a ticket thing because she's buying two tickets for her yeah. and her date. Uh, and then there's the, the plumber's crack, you know, when he makes the plumber's crack um, yeah. joke. Well, and he says, you know, the guy's supposed to buy the tickets. And she says, really? Does Susan Faludi know about this? Uh, Susan <laughs> Faludi is an American feminist writer and the author of Backlash. Yes, she is. And... Uh, what was the plumber's crack joke? I wrote it down, but I don't remember what it was. Oh boy! Oh, he making he's... fun of the boyfriend or the the, the date that she's yeah. Tris- Tristan says he... that uh, she would only be buying the ticket if her boyfriend is like too poor or something, and she yeah. says that yeah, she she likes them poor and bald and with a beer gut with a, with a plumber's and... crack that really sends me through the roof. Yes, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. She's good. Yeah. I I like but... this scene because it feels like Rory has kind of finally really figured out how to deal with these people like she has she, she has the a upper very hand. successful scene for her yes, yeah she's very good did you notice her reading material i did but scene. i forgot okay. i thought the contrast was really interesting she's reading mary mccarthy here and i didn't look who, up who that was <clears throat> she's a, a, a name i recognize but lorelei is reading the new yorker mm. now when have we ever seen lorelei reading the new yorker that's pretty wild and when she's talking to her mom she's flipping through the new yorker so mary mccarthy is an american critic and novelist yeah but she's not somebody i expect a teenage girl to read i think but yeah. anyway but then later on there's somebody else she's reading we'll get to that in a minute and that's a much more appropriate book for her so then then emily arrives yeah. and instead of getting up because she can't get up lorelei she can't get up off the couch because mm-hmm. she's in pain she just yells, we're in here. And Emily comes in and says, is that how you open the door? And uh, Lorelai responds, well, all out of saran wrap. Do you get that? I could, I did not get that. But, but then her mom says, Emily says, I don't even want to figure that one out. I couldn't figure it out either. Okay, so I, I, I can't give you a definitive explanation, but I will say that my assumption is that that's some sort of prank reference because you use saran wrap in a number of different pranks. Uh, okay. So that is that is my guess. Maybe that, I, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how you would use it. I don't know, saran wrap over the door or something. But I think she's making a joke of 
I think the joke that she's making is that she actually intended to be even more uncouth and impolite, okay, but she didn't right. have the material to do so. Well, and so <laughs> Emily <laughs> says she, she doesn't even want to figure that one out. I couldn't figure it out either, but I, I it was so, they delivered it so hilariously that I had to, to pause the show and laugh for a while because it was it was just very funny um it's a it's a very cute back and forth it's yeah. very cute yeah so so then they make dean walk up to the door yeah so dean he, uh, so actually it's just slightly before this i just want to just briefly mention uh that suki also arrives uh to bring lorelei uh tacos food. yeah tacos food. and burritos and her <laughs> specific burritos. advice to Rory is to walk down a flight of stairs because she looks like a movie star and movie stars have to walk down staircases. Oh, it is very sweet. Which is very cute. (laughs) I also wanted to mention that I prefer Rory's look with the boots. I I thought that was great too, but you know, I like that better, but I was afraid she would forget and wear those and that would be a scene at the dance where they were making fun of her. So Mm. we like it, but this is Chilton. She can't wear boots with a dress, yeah. Yeah, it's true. Although, I don't know, I, I just... I personally am not super into heels, both because of how they feel and also just like, I don't know, some some heels are cute, but a lot of them are just like not really my aesthetic. And I yeah. think it is dumb that it is required that you wear these ridiculously uncomfortable shoes to a dance. <laughs> And they, and they put you at a disadvantage. Yeah. High heels put women at a disadvantage. We are not as stable on our feet when we mm-hmm. wear them. We can't walk very fast. We can't keep up. It's a, it is definitely a throwback. I don't know why we haven't carried <laughs> that <laughs> Outside of uh, Sex in the City, you know, and shoes and everything, I don't know how we don't get rid of that. It's like, yeah. we what what year is it? We're still wearing three-inch heels? Really? Yeah. I don't know. I, I don't do it. I wear boots. <laughs> yeah, same here. Same here. But yeah, um, so, so then Dean arrives and starts honking because that is what he and Rory agreed to beforehand, but Emily will not have it. Nope, she will not. And, and... Rory listens to her. She does what her grandmother tells her to do. She stands there and waits, even though they're all kind of thinking that Dean, well, they're afraid Dean isn't going to figure it out. Mm -hmm. He's just going to keep honking and sit Mm -hmm. out there until she comes out. But she has told him, you know, just just honk and I'll come out. Mm -hmm. Then he honks. She doesn't come out. They're all standing there waiting and waiting and waiting. Mm -hmm. And and one of them, is 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 it Emily that says, well, is he not very smart? Or Yeah, I think it's Emily. She's like, well, he's not very bright, is he? Yeah, that's it. So he finally comes to the door and gets introduced to Emily as Emily Post. Yes. Which I thought was hilarious. She says, meet my mother, Emily Post, because, of course, in this instance, she is an Emily. Mm-hmm. I also, however, I also think that she's not wrong. He should have come to the door. Even if the roles are reversed, if the girl is picking up the guy, I, I, I think you should go to the door and get them. I, you know, but they're young and they... And, and informal, yeah, it's a very casual relationships. So they had set this up, but I don't think Emily is completely wrong. She just doesn't understand their dynamic. I mean, I don't think she's wrong in theory. The reason that that she's wrong in this situation is just because Rory and Dean agreed beforehand that this is yes. what they were going to do. That's just as rude, by yeah. the way. Yeah, yes. yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. So yeah, so Dean does come in. Emily does meet him. She's also pretty cold to him. This this exchange doesn't last very long, but there's like a moment where he introduces himself to her and she just stares back at him with this like very cold stare. And it's very Emily, but it also kind of, I think, underlines how unreasonable she can be sometimes. She doesn't know anything about this guy and she's already giving him this like really rude, cold stare, which I think is part of why she doesn't doesn't get how Rory doesn't quite fit in at Chilton because to her if if you have done any kind of breach of etiquette even if you had no idea and had no reason to know that that was the etiquette you deserve this kind of treatment and so that's yeah. just what she does yeah and you know he he looks a little different too his hair is long he does he's not wearing a tie which was I was a little I mean I I Rory told him he didn't have to yeah but she must have known that that was not, you know, the dress code was would require a tie. Emily is looking for the Baccarat candlesticks. Oh, my God. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah Emily pretty much. So Emily uh, 
insists on staying with Lorelai because she figures out that Lorelai is injured. And I actually do think it's good that someone stays with Lorelai. But of course, it's Emily. So she immediately starts rooting through their belongings, looking for this gift that she gave Lorelai. And then Lorelai eventually reveals that she traded them in for this monkey lamp, which Emily refers to as a semi-pornographic leering monkey lamp. <laughs> And it's really awful. <laughs> it's, it's really it's pretty awful. ugly. And and you know, this is another time where I'm on, on Emily's side. Is that yeah. mean I'm getting old? But <laughs> but first of all, it was a gift from your mother. It was a gift. Period. Yeah. I mean, when somebody gives me a gift, even if I hate it, I hold on to it for years before I get rid of it. Yeah. It's just rude, you know. And this is a gift from her mom that she knew she must have known it would become would become obvious at some point that these she no longer had these candlesticks. Mm-hmm. And plus, they must have been gorgeous. Why would you trade in gorgeous candlestick? And I realize they have a casual lifestyle. I understand that. But wow, yeah. trade in <laughs> yeah. crystal candlesticks for this ugly monkey lamp and yeah. I mean, it is ugly <laughs> it is pretty ugly i don't like it at all uh and i don't i i did look up baccarat candlesticks there are a lot of different images uh out there sure. but yeah but they do seem generally you know very classy kind of exactly what you would think emily would buy and they are pretty and yeah my thinking is you know if you don't want them out all the time they could just be like christmas decorations or something you know just put mm-hmm. them in with your box of christmas decorations and bring them out once oh, a year on, on the mantle put them on the yeah. mantle you know yeah. I mean, it just doesn't but anyway so we did skip over the outsiders reference there's um, okay so pony boy and i'm trying to remember if it if who mentions this but one of them is, calls the other one pony boy and maybe it's uh yeah does Jean call her that i so i think she call him that i think she brings up the outsiders and then maybe says call me pony boy and then later on yeah, he calls her like... pony boy yeah. yeah, there's a reference to it, and I had to look it up because I've never seen The Outsiders, even though it's from uh, yeah. Coppola. Um, oh, is it? Now, it was a yeah, book it originally. Is. And it was a book, but it's a movie. Yeah. And uh, and, I, and I'm thinking, man, I need to see this because I see it in almost all of his films. But anyway, he is the greaser in the movie because okay. it's about, you know, ta- it's in a, I think it's set in a university town maybe. Anyway, so he's a greaser played by C. Thomas Howell who has been in so many movies, hundreds of movies and TV shows. So he's kind of ubiquitous, so you might not even notice him anymore. He's a character actor. He was in Torchwood, Criminal mm-hmm. Minds, Bosch. I looked this up. Psych, 24. He's a chameleon. He just he doesn't look the same in any of these TV shows or movies. So anyway, I just want to throw that in there. And I have that on my list now to watch The Outsiders. But anyway, so he played Pony Boy in the movie. And getting back to the scene with the candlesticks, they finished that argument. And you could see that Emily just wants to take care of her daughter, wants to take care of her baby. She yeah. didn't really get to finish being a mother to her. She makes her some, um, she makes her bread, toast with banana, mashed banana, which is just awful. She doesn't, she says, well, I made this for you a lot when you were a kid and you were sick. And Lorelai doesn't remember this. That's, that's yeah. kind of heartbreaking that she doesn't remember this. But then she has food that she can, so uh, Emily says, well, I can warm it up. And Lorelai says, I can eat it cold. And Emily says, hot's better, though. It's like, no, uh, it, no, no, no. no. Lorelai says hot's better though when she sees the look on Emily's face yeah. so she's giving in because Emily wants to take care of her yeah. she realizes she recognizes that in there because there are times when she wants to take care of her daughter when she mm-hmm. thinks she needs it and Emily wants to do that for her and she gives it a lesser which is very sweet yeah I think it's a shift between Lorelai thinking that her mom is doing too much and then realizing that her mom is just trying to be mom again she just yeah. wants to be mommy she and, wants to be her mommy and, and it's uh, very sweet and, and they bond over Barbara Stanwyck, yes. who really does have a wonderfully great husky voice. Yeah. Have you ever heard her voice? She's a gorgeous voice. And a gorgeous woman and a great actress. Do you know what movie they're watching? I, I couldn't, I didn't catch it. They didn't say. Okay. And I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it was. But during the course of that movie, while well, they're watching that and a couple of other things together, they're sitting yes. on the couch because she doesn't want to leave her alone. Mm-hmm. Um, she says, you shouldn't be here overnight by yourself. Mm-hmm. And at some point she says to her, you did a, love, a lovely job. And I think, um, Laurel, I think she means the dress. And she said, with Rory and the dress. It's very, very sweet. It's actually, it's right after Lorelai finally. So Lorelai, when Emily shows up and sees Rory in her dress, she assumes that they bought it and says something along the lines of, I'm glad you bought her a dress. 
And then in this scene, Lorelai reveals that in fact she made the dress. And so Emily, it's kind of a moment of concession. She says, you did a lovely job. And then a brief pause with Rory and the dress. And it's it's very sweet. It is. It is very sweet. And unfortunately, it is just setting us up for (laughs) that to all come crashing down. Oh, I know. It's Uh, it's not good. Yeah. (laughs) But meanwhile, at the dance, we get a bunch of drama basically uh they so uh, this is where i would like to talk a little bit about the fashion so so dean and rory show up at the dance there is a little bit uh, of back and forth with them in the car where rory is still not totally convinced that she wants to go but she does really mm-hmm. want to go uh he so does, yeah. so they show up and paris's two flunkies louise and madeline immediately go over to them because basically they're they're like sitting there bored these two girls are kind of defined by being easily bored <laughs> that's their main character yeah. trait and between the two of them louise is much more i guess the term is boy crazy uh she's just flirtatious Lu- yeah first, louise is flirtatious yeah, very yeah. flirtatious very focused on dean men. who's beautiful <laughs> yeah and she but she tries to flirt with him yeah she immediately sets her sights on dean meanwhile madeline who i kind of like is just sort of kind of an airhead but in like a weird way so that they <laughs> madeline and uh louise go over and madeline or Madeline, I'm not sure. Madeline compliments Rory's dress, and Rory says that her mom made it, and Madeline just goes off on this weird little tangent about how her mom can't make anything except soup. She makes soup. And meanwhile, Louise is, like, hard-hitting on Dean right in front of Rory. Yeah. Fortunately, Dean knows exactly how to deal with this situation and basically just, like, walks around so that he can put his arms around Rory and make it very clear that Louise's incessant flirtation is not going to go anywhere. So they lose interest and walk away. Uh, But Madeline, I think in general, Madeline is kind of the nicer of the two. She's usually the one who says Mm -hmm. something a little bit nicer. Whereas Louise, like, like we said, is more flirtatious and is a little bit more vicious she she's louise oh yeah yeah louise is usually the one who falls down on the kind of meaner side Mm -hmm. um but then they run into uh paris i think Mm -hmm. i think that's yeah they, they run into paris and uh they meet paris actually has a beautiful dress i mean the other two girls have it's okay actually I, I thought it was it was a beautiful green color. Right? I, I thought the I color was really color. nice. I just thought the yeah. cut was really boring. It's it's just like straight down. Oh well, I, I well, see that's appealing to me. I like that. I like. I I just really like the dress a lot. I but did the think color that especially. I thought that Paris had the second best dress after Rory, but that's mainly because see, the other dresses. So this is my thing about Madeline and Louise's dresses. They're wearing like a crochet knit that like. It's, yes, they're, they're not ugly. They're just they just do not look nice enough to be wearing them to a dance. Like it's like, are you so elitist that you're wearing an everyday dress that you could wear <laughs> to the office? Yeah, like it's yeah, you it's could like wear it that, to the office. Yeah. I mean, I guess they do go to a school where they have to wear uniforms every day. So mm, maybe to any dress. Yeah. yeah, maybe it's just like this is a chance for them to wear something different. I actually do kind of like Madeline's dress, but not to wear to a dance. It's yeah. just. But, it looks but, like a sweater. <laughs> but Paris's dress is appropriate for a dance, and it's that that uh, chartreuse color, that kind of green, mm-hmm. and it's just gorgeous. I think it and it and it it's perfect for her body, but it also sets up her color really well. So she looks good in it, and yeah. and, and and she looks so good that you would think Tristan would notice her. Yeah, and yet he still does not. I, yeah. Also, she dumps herself down around him, which bothers me all the time. She is a, probably the smartest kid in that school, mm-hmm. and she dumps herself down for Tristan, and cannot see that that makes her even less appealing to him. Yeah, if she if she were if she stand up to him and be her her funky, um, angry self <laughs> that you know that she is with everybody else, Tristan might actually like her. She's afraid to be herself. I mean, maybe. It's really hard to tell with him um, because I think his initial attraction to Rory is was largely based on just the fact that she was new and she was really cute. Yeah. And so he saw her as this kind of target. Tristan doesn't treat women like they're people. He treats them like they are prey. Uh, and yeah. Well, Ro- yeah. And Rory made the most interesting prey because she was new and cute and because she wasn't interested in him. 
but I'm not sure that that last one would be enough because he's known Paris for so long. Yeah, that's true. So I do want to say that, like, I, I think her dress is a very pretty color, and I, like, Liza Wheel is a beautiful actress. Um, it is kind of wild to me that we treat Paris like she couldn't get a boyfriend and granted she is a very intense personality but just like she's she's very beautiful i'm definitely sure that one of these boys would have asked her out but whatever but her dress i think the thing that strikes me about her dress is that it feels like the dress of someone 15 years older like that is an adult. Well, that's Paris. That's Paris I mean, yeah. all over the place. Yeah, for she sure. Is, I'm not saying is, it's. Uh, I'm not saying it's out of character. Years older. <laughs> I'm not saying it's out yeah, of character. No. I'm just saying it's a little boring. Well, for you, I guess I'm older than you because I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I didn't dislike it. It's just like if I'm going to what might be the best dressed occasion of the year, I'm gonna wear something a little bit flashier. Okay, so here, than a shift here's dress. a point to make. My daughter and I are very different when it comes to fashion. We'll just point this out. I am looking at her right now and she has teal hair yes <laughs> and, and and loves uh you love a much more flouncy feminine that's not i'm not not feminine i mean i mm-hmm. think i am feminine but you're way more feminine than me and you you what you like things that are flouncy and uh bright colored i like bright colors too i can't even i'm not describing this right but right now i'm in a white t-shirt and blue jeans yeah and what are you wearing <laughs> i am wearing a pink uh peasant blouse and ripped <laughs> jeans <laughs> oh wow that's 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 pretty good okay that's unusual but, but yeah um but last weekend, what did you wear to the pumpkin? You know, so oh yeah, I, I did, I did, patch. I did wear a corset to the pumpkin patch. There you go. Where well, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> and and you also love drag shows and yeah, drag I, makeup and I, I and love that to kind go all thing. out. And you you go all out. Yeah. And if I wear mascara, it's that's my all out. So there you go. Yeah. So we are very different when it comes to fashion. So the the the, the simple cut of this this short beautiful chartreuse colored dress to me is just gorgeous but you think it's too plain (laughs) yeah it's just a little boring i don't know i mean i like it 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 reads to me like something an adult professional would wear to a professional function and yes it does (laughs) that's that's great that's not actually what is happening here and it is it is very paris like the thing that i appreciate about this is that it is very true to paris's personality she is kind of a little professional 30 year old trapped in the body of a 16 17 year old girl who has been cursed to have a crush on tristan for some reason Yo, oh my God. And what is that about? Let's, let's just address that for a second. I, self-sabotage? <laughs> how could she not see what a horrible human being he is? And how, how horribly he treats her? He insults her? He, he doesn't talk to any of the girls except in an insulting mm-hmm. and humiliating manner. He is always mm-hmm. trying to put them in their place, even if he likes him and he likes Rory. Mm-hmm. But he, he's always trying to put her in her place. Why can't Paris, who is is the strong uh, feminist young mm-hmm. woman, why can't she see that? I, I, I do not understand that. I, okay, so... And he's not even that attractive. He's not yeah. even that attractive. I, I know you're going to say, well, he's a cute boy. He's not that cute. Well, that, that's, I don't think. that's not actually what I was going to say, but I will say, it, you know, it's, it's a personal taste thing. I do not find him that attractive, but I feel compelled to speak on behalf of my generation that I know a lot of girls who thought he was super cute. He was the, like, that actor was one of the it boys of that time period. So, yes, was you, you are... Was he Dean? Uh, oh, yeah, for sure. What? No, they, they both were. Okay. That's reassuring. <laughs> yeah, no, the, the guy who, I mean, the guy who plays Dean is kind of still that because Supernatural went on for 50 million years <laughs> and it, it has a mostly female fan base. But yeah, no, they, 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 they both were. I, I mean, uh, Chad Michael Murray was in a greater number of teen directed mm-hmm. things. But Mm -hmm. tons of girls had a crush on Dean. I mean, if you were just watching Gilmore Girls, you were probably more likely to have a crush on Dean than, or to have a crush on, I have totally lost the actor's name temporarily, but to have a crush on the guy playing Dean than um, Chad Michael Murray. But if you were watching all of the teen things, you would be seeing Chad Michael Murray in so many different things. And that was just, that was kind of his thing, is that he played cute boys. Uh, Whereas the guy who plays Dean 
uh, plays I'm, bad boys. Well, he he doesn't exactly play bad boys, but he he played Dean, and then he went on t- pretty much directly to Supernatural, where he plays. He actually plays the good boy of the two brothers, but it, it is a more masculine type. Yeah. Well, and he, he's got dark hair. He's He's got that bad boy look. But it seems to me that I read somewhere one time that we think of, you know, blonde actors as golden boys and they usually play good guys hmm. and dark haired actors as, as bad boys guy actors when when in reality that's not really the case yeah um they a lot of times they they, it's just the opposite in fact the 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 golden boy is often the bad boy i mean i don't think that hair color actually determines whether or not you're good or bad no no no, how they're depicted i'm talking about i'm talking about how they're depicted in in literary forms and stuff Mm -hmm. too so it's it's just the opposite of what you think yeah it's jared padalecki by the way i had to look it up but dean is played by jared padalecki i'm not sure why i forgot that name oh yeah 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 yeah. Um, but yeah, so, oh, so they run into Rory and they meet Jacob, who is her date, but who pretty quickly reveals himself to actually be Paris's, Paris's cousin. Date. Yeah. Paris's date. He's, yeah, turns sorry. Out he's to be her cousin. He's Paris's yeah. date turns out to be her cousin. Rory. Yeah. <laughs> He shows up to hit on Rory, and I'm going to be honest, I think he's kind of a creep. I think the way that he hits on her is super creepy. he's very creepy. Yeah, but Rory basically just kind of ignores him and, like, takes the information that he is Paris's cousin, and, like, the implication in this moment is that maybe she's going to use that information, but it turns out that she was just, like, amused by it privately and wasn't actually going to tell anyone. Because she's not Paris. She's not out to hurt people. She and, keeps it to herself until Paris reveals it. And she also is kind of the one who realizes that it's not really a zero-sum game, that hurting Paris mm-hmm. wouldn't actually help her. Paris sees right. everything as a zero-sum game. Paris thinks every time mm-hmm. she hurts Rory that she gains something. Something, and that's not really true no it's not an either or yeah yeah it's you know yeah you you don't actually gain like you know she she could humiliate rory and that would not make tristan like her like that's just not how well, it works and, and, and the way their relationship grows over time paris really learns a lot from rory yes. when they do eventually become friends um and she le- figures that out so her parents have, have made her this competitive wreck yeah you know and and she she sees everything as a competition mm-hmm. but rory doesn't she's more of the lift everybody up kind of philosophy that she gets from her mother yeah that that paris did not get so in a way paris is stunted emotionally yeah. because she doesn't yeah. know how to do that absolutely and i think it's also you know i mean i don't think rory is a great friend to lane but lane is a great friend to rory which means that mm-hmm. rory has experienced true yes. positive female friendship whereas paris's two friends don't really seem to get her at all madeline is kind of too uh spacey for paris and louise is too boy obsessed for paris like but, neither but of they them... do what she tells them to do they they're, do they're her slaves but do we ever see them having real conversations they're, they're just lackeys no, no. they're not friends they're lackeys yeah, yeah yeah they're lackeys that's it that's all they are yeah which is sad I, so. I did also want to note that uh in the scene where jacob and rory are talking beck is playing in the background it's a song called mixed business anyway <laughs> i did not notice that who is it by beck oh beck i thought you said yeah. beth Beck, okay. B-E-C-K. Okay, B-E-C-K. And what's yeah. the song? Mixed Business. I did not notice that. I don't often notice them. I, there's so much going on in the dialogue. In the, in these, yeah. Uh, this, this is a show that is dialogue heavy. And I have, I'm have i hearing, slightly hearing impaired. So I am reading this show as it goes. <laughs> I'm trying to keep up. So no, I don't always notice I, the music. I usually, only, I usually only notice it if I recognized it. And I, I, well, I recognize that. You recognize it, yeah. yeah. And, and usually if there is music that is that the, you can hear... The closed captioning will mention it. So that's when I notice it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, I, I think it's from the album Midnight Vultures, and I am very familiar with that album. Yeah. I know you are. I, love that. <laughs> I do. Oh, yeah. So then the, the kind of the final couple of scenes at the dance, Paris apparently finds out that Jacob told Rory the truth and she comes over to Rory basically to humiliate herself. Like she, she basically starts freaking out that Rory knows this uh, thing about her and preemptively accidentally humiliates herself in her attempt to, I guess, threaten Rory into... N- I'm not I'm not totally sure what she thought she was doing here. I, I mean, I think she's just freaking out when she comes over 
and starts talking to Rory about it, I think she just like does not know how to respond uh, because she's been found out like this. She's very distraught. There are three emotionally emotionally difficult, maybe bordering on violent uh, scenes in this episode. Yeah. And we'll get this the first one. So to, to try and visualize this, Lorelai, uh, Lorelai, Rory is sitting at the table and Paris comes up to her and is leaning over her in a kind of uh, aggressive manner. And she starts off presumably whispering. We can't, it's hard mm-hmm. to tell, but she's presumably whispering and saying, so now you know something, you're just going to use it against me. I mean, she keeps going mm-hmm. for about 30 seconds getting louder and louder and louder the pa- the camera pulls back just enough oh, so first of all it cuts back and forth between her face and Rory's face and Rory's getting this horrified look on her face yeah and, and the camera pulls back and you can see every you can't see the faces of the teens behind it but you can see their bodies and they all seem to be stilling and are get, becoming still and turning towards the scene where you know Paris is kind of going a little insane mm-hmm. and just as you see that Rory tells her you need to understand that you are the one who is telling the story to this yeah to this the crowd here not me I yeah. had no intention of it but you just told everybody at that point then the camera pulls back pretty far and you can see the faces of the teens behind her yeah and she stands up and is horrified and humiliated has done that to herself yes and walks out and that is classic Paris Mm -hmm. but it's also a very difficult scene Mm because you can see what's happening what she's doing that and you know I'm sitting there as a mother thinking what did your mother do to you that you 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 have this level of anger and yeah anger and and anxiety and also I mean she's she's assuming that Rory thinks like she does she's assuming that Rory thinks this is all a zero-sum game just like Paris does Mm -hmm. just like Louise does well, and, and why? And I think it's because she's been so cloistered. I mean, she's yeah. had such a, a you know, a, a life that's not been, that's been picked out for her. Her life mm-hmm. has been scheduled and selected for her and everything's been, you know, you, you, you're in this family, you're going to do X, Y, Z. And she doesn't have any real world experience. And, mm-hmm. and Rory is definitely, you know, just kind of shoots a bullet into that. And she doesn't know how to react to Rory. She's so mm-hmm. different. I kind of think that I hope <laughs> part of Paris's brain is saying, I need to be more like this person, but it takes a really long time for that to happen. So I mean, I'm not even sure that that's what she needs to do. I think what she needs to do is just become more comfortable with herself. And actually to relate this back to her obsession with Tristan, I would actually argue that I don't think it's just because he's a cute boy. I think it's because he is kind of their generation's representative of the old money patriarchy uh yes because remember how easily he fell into conversation with richard and the old guys at um rory's other birthday party a couple episodes ago you know he he is the product of those generations the product of that yes like raising a kid with that much wealth that much self-entitlement and you know the assumption is that he's going to go to an ivy league school and ascend to these ranks and paris does on the surface fit in with these people better than rory does but she has also really internalized their incessant competitiveness and i think she has also internalized the sexism of this society yeah she recognizes Tristan as somebody who would please her family yes he would fit right in in her sheltered world in her sheltered universe exactly and and I think you know getting like if if she were to quote-unquote get him if she were to be able to date him it's it's almost I think more about what he represents and how that would validate her sense of self and and, and, you know I I was just uh listening to a, a clip today about this woman talking about how women are so often defined by their relationships and I think a little bit of that is inside of Paris's mind when she looks at Tristan it's it's almost like it doesn't matter how much she achieves on her own what really matters to many of the people especially in this social class is what kind of a man she can get and Tristan she is her, currently cat. yeah He's exactly a cat. And, and a successful one. And I think that's a little bit reflected in the way that she talks about him to Rory. Because the thing that she says is, there's no way your date is better than Tristan. 
like she at that point wow, when she says yeah. that to her she's never met dean she has no freaking idea who this is but she views tristan as basically the pinnacle of what you can get if you're trying to get a boy <laughs> yeah so, which is yeah. sad and it's sad. and and it, and it is a very restricted view of the universe. And mm-hmm. uh, whereas Rory has been exposed to so much, and now she's a children, Chilton, mm-hmm. so she's been expo- exposed to this world too. But she's been exposed to so much of the real world that she can that she can open herself up in yeah. ways that um, that Paris cannot, at least not yet. And it, Paris is probably a little jealous of that too. Yeah, I think. for sure. So, yeah, I think so. Uh, so, but but the next scene, this kind of moves into, and I can't remember how it moves, but Dean and Tristan, and Tristan. get into it. Yeah, yeah. So Dean is kind of astounded. He says, "You you want to fight me? You want to fight?" Yeah. <laughs> and and Tristan says, "Well, th- something like was it that? Does that seem strange?" He said, "Well, it'd be like fighting an accountant." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you you don't you don't want to fight me, yeah. Dean says, "Because I'll kill you." Yeah. I mean, he, he's obviously bigger and tougher, mm-hmm. um, but Tristan seems to want to get hurt. It's like that would prove something to himself, prove his manhood. Even if the guy beats beats him up, at least he can take a punch. I you think know, also, so. like, I think a lot of Tristan's relating to Rory, uh, I mean, it's been very clear to us that he does have a crush on her even if he's not like oh yeah you know it's it started as a sort of prove my masculinity thing but he has he has sort of made himself be obsessed with her and that obsession has come out in a very aggressive way and now that dean has shown up it's like he has a quote-unquote acceptable male target for all of this aggression that he's been Mm -hmm. spewing at rory good point the more that rory resists Mm-hmm. the more he wants her it's like mm-hmm. it's, it's like she is the thing he cannot have yep. and he has always gotten everything he wants. and this is a classic trope but it's it's just they do it so well in this show i mean the, yeah. the writing is just so good i think they also do do a pretty good job in this scene of making it clear that dean doesn't want to have this fight you know, no. Dean, Dean is constantly trying to walk away, but he's also getting angrier because he can both, first of all, because Tristan is being freaking obnoxious, but also mm-hmm. because he can see that this is what Rory has been putting up with. You know, he's yeah. she has told him a little bit about Tristan before, and now that he sees Tristan in the flesh, he can see that it is, in fact, way worse than Rory ever let on. Yeah. <laughs> and and he's, he's pissed about that, and he's pissed about this little twerp getting in his face. Yeah, he, he definitely, uh, and, he, and he threatens him, do not yeah. come near her. And yeah. he, she's been telling him what Tristan, I, I don't know, has she actually told Dean we, everything we haven't, that Tristan has done? We haven't seen it, we just, when he first meets Tristan, he says that Rory has told him about Tristan. Okay, so he yeah. knows, but the insult, calling her Mary, uh, and he tells him, do not come near her. Yeah, I, I have a little bit of mixed feelings about that because, I, like, I do think that Tristan very much egged him on. Mm-hmm. I do also think that it was already in Dean to be a little bit possessive of her. I think that he is trying to stand up for her by saying that, but I also kind of wish that he had phrased it differently. Like, I sort yeah. of wish that he had phrased it as, you need to stop bugging her. Do not come near her just to me sounds a little bit too close to... I own this woman, you need to stop hitting on her. <laughs> well, and, and it, it delineates their positions, too, because Tristan is upper upper class money. Mm-hmm. Dean is very much a working class kid. I mean, he's mm-hmm. a smart working class kid, and you know he's going to go to college, but he is definitely not not even in Rory and Lorelai's world. You mm-hmm. know, although he does read a lot, and he knows he gets all the movie references. He's a smart kid. He's done that on his own, is my impression. I don't know. We don't know much about his parents yet. Yeah. Or, or that maybe we never do. But he definitely comes across as a working class kid who has is just super smart but there's there's definitely you know there's different social classes going on there and he's representing the the class that typically would be the one to bring the fist first but in this situation it's tristan who hits him yeah it is tristan who hits him and yet if you weren't there for all of it you can see how easily it could be misinterpreted as dean is the aggressor entirely because dean is bigger and more impressive looking and it has a deeper voice too and has a deeper deeper voice voice. yeah yeah (laughs) and i think that also kind of reflects you know some real world dynamics because first of all Tristan 
already has all of the privilege to get out of this situation. Uh, like if, if the two of them were to get in trouble for this, we just kind of know that Tristan would get off and Dean would be punished worse, even though Tristan was absolutely the aggressor. And that, that and that's kind of it. At that point, Rory and Dean leave. It is sort of funny. Uh, one, one of the thoughts that I had in this scene was, wow, this, this dance was kind of boring, except for everything that happened around Rory. <laughs> like Rory definitely brought the drama to this dance. I can imagine being a kid at this dance and then the, like the next week, everyone would be talking about the various dramas that Rory was involved in. I kind of feel like she's, she has picked up some street cred in this with the school with the other kids at the school there are looks of respect on mm -hmm. the other kids faces when she's leaving so they've gotten to know who she is a little bit more they respect that she's got this gorgeous boyfriend uh, that you know because they're all pretty shallow but she also has held her own mm -hmm. and I think they all I, I, there's it's a turning point in, in yeah. her relationship with the other school students let's get into the kind of final um, conflict well, there's oh, one yeah. more scene before the conflict that's very touching. Lorelai falls asleep mm -hmm. on the sofa. She and I guess she's taking one of those pills. She falls mm -hmm. asleep. Her mother covers her up, and she sleepily says, "Thank you, mommy." Then we cut back to um, Dean and Rory walking yes. home. Yeah, and or, or at some point they parked the car and walked because like, he had to drive. Yeah, I, I'm actually yeah. I'm not sure why this the oh they the went to get a this, coffee. Yeah, so they, they went to get a coffee. They parked their car. They went to get a coffee, and then we come in on them walking out of the gazebo, which I I'm assuming they did because it's a cute shot, but it does have the implication that they somehow bought the coffees inside of the gazebo, which definitely didn't or happen. Or they walked through it, maybe. <laughs> I guess. But the conversation is 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 interesting. Yeah. And he analyzes Tristan for her and says, well, mm -hmm. he has a thing for you. And he says yeah. this three times. He three has times. a thing for you. He has a thing for you. He has a thing mm -hmm. for you. And she doesn't, he's not getting it. Because in her mind, and this makes perfect logical sense, why would somebody who has a quote unquote thing for me treat me that way? Uh huh. She can't make sense of this. Now, Dean understands it completely. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's a different male female thing. I don't know. But yeah. It's, it's hard to say because, I mean, I, well, first of all, I do think that it has been much clearer in this episode how mm -hmm. Tristan feels. I think yeah, that's true. Up until now, it has mostly been him harassing Rory. But first of all, in this episode, at the when she's waiting in line for the tickets, he does kind of try to ask her out. And that's the first yeah. time that he's done that. Well, and why? Why is he asking her? Because he sees that she buys two tickets, mm -hmm. which means she is bringing a date. Mm -hmm. And that brings out the monster in him. Yeah. yeah. It could also, you know, I mean, I will also say that, like, I think the way that he likes her is a very, is kind of a public performance in itself. And yeah. so it, it could also be that this was the first time that there's going to be a dance, which is a public thing. So what's the point in asking her out before he can show off to everyone that he got the new girl? Yeah. I don't like Tristan. <laughs> I know, well, no, no, nobody does. We're not supposed to like him. But yeah, but yeah. Uh, and Dean so is totally right. And, and he does, I, I think he finally gets Rory to see it a little bit. I would also say that, you know, he's maybe a little bit more on the lookout for something like this, not just yes. as a, not just as a possessive boyfriend thing, but also as someone who has a clearer idea of what Rory appears to be to other people. Like Rory yes. sees herself as just this quiet nerd that nobody notices Dean mm -hmm. sees her as this beautiful girl that lots of people notice. And, and so they have the conversation that was mm -hmm. that was foreshadowed at the beginning of the episode. Yes. Was, have you had the conversation yet? And, you know, we're thinking birds and bees, but it's really uh, it's really about the status and nature of their relationship. So mm -hmm. they have a conversation about whether or not he's her boyfriend. Not, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not we're in a relationship or whether or not we're dating. But it's he, so there's a thing about having a boyfriend mm -hmm. <laughs> that is, you know, embedded in American culture, I guess. Yeah. And that's what's coming out here. And are you my boyfriend? Are you my boyfriend? And, well, does that mean that I'm your girlfriend? And they have this conversation. It's kind of disgusting. I mean, I, I <laughs> to me, but then I'm, you know, I'm old. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, what? There's so many other interesting things you'd be talking about, in including, you know, analyzing what just I, went down at the party. I have never had this. I have never had this talk. I, I, me neither. I Who talks like this? Talk. Are you my boyfriend? I mean, if, you, if you've been on a, if you've been, you've been dating 
if you had three or four dates, then he's mm-hmm. your boyfriend. I mean, I don't, it's not even to me a sort of moot point. It's not. I even, mean, it's not I do an think, important point. Yeah, I, I, I like, I, I do think it's good to have a talk about expectations. Honestly, with my current partner, it was very clear within a couple of dates that neither of us were dating anybody else, and that was yeah. kind of all I really cared about. But like, basically, our version of this conversation was, uh, I was over at his house for our like normal or at his apartment for our normal date night and he like took a call from an international friend and told him on the phone like hey I gotta go I'm hanging out with my girlfriend and I was like okay I guess we're using that term all right (laughs) here we are yeah and that's usually the way most people hear it the first time in reference like that Mm -hmm. but to actually have a conversation about whether or not he's her boyfriend and actually the only time I've ever seen I have ever seen conversations like this have been in in, in TV television shows. Yeah. yeah it's like they, yeah. they make a big thing out of it because maybe it's a but maybe it's a, it's a technique they need to use to get something across in the storyline yeah they haven't been able to establish in the dialogue or something i don't know I, I mean i do think this moment because what happens is rory sort of offhandedly refers to him as her boyfriend she says like i'm not sure how i feel about my boyfriend defending my yes. honor and he's Which is like the way it naturally happens yes That's the way it naturally happens yeah and then they have this whole weird conversation this whole conversation but i do think it represents a turning point for rory because just like she did before she tries to back away from that terminology and then after she has successfully backed away from it she goes actually do you want to be my boyfriend so i think i do think it represents sweet yeah it's, it's also like i think it represents a moment of her taking a step forward in her confidence you know, she she does yeah. commit to asking him this question in a way that she never really she never really outright asked him to go to the dance with her. <laughs> no, she so, never did. Yeah, and yeah, it's it's definitely a step forward for her, and she has these. And what book is she reading? He says her bag is really heavy. Uh, Dorothy Parker, the the, the little portable the, the portable, portable there Dorothy we go. Parker, the portable and Dorothy Parker. So we have seen her read Mary McCarthy, yes, <laughs> and Dorothy Parker, and this Dorothy Parker being, in my opinion, the much better choice. Oh yeah, but it's also it's mostly just quotes and, and stuff because that's what she's known for. Yeah, because Dorothy Parker is known for these really witty quotes. Oh yeah, um, incredible. And yeah, I, yeah I, I feel like the, the portable Dorothy Parker is the most apt for Rory to oh. be reading. And yeah. for, for Lorelai, too. I mean, yeah. you know, it's like, I, it surprised me that Lorelai was reading The New Yorker. Yeah. Unless she was just skimming through to find the Dorothy Parker quotes, you know. Well, but, maybe she's like me and her mom gave her a subscription that she never asked for. So she just has these <laughs> sitting all around her house. Maybe that's it. <laughs> and you know what? <sighs> Two years later, and I am still getting letters from New Yorker saying, you got to be careful. Your daughter's subscription is about to expire. We still anyway. have. I've, I read like one of them. <laughs> and, and you have a pile of yep, 26 they're just, or they're no, sit- 50, 52. <laughs> they're sitting around somewhere. I know uh, my partner made a real dedicated effort to read as many of them as possible. I basically said, if there's something you think I'd like to read, I'll read it. And I, I, I had like one that I, there was one article that I read that turned out to be super depressing. So I ended up stopping <laughs> Well, okay, so let's just point out that this is a thing about The New Yorker. It's it's a very difficult magazine to keep up with. You mm-hmm. have to be a voracious reader and because it, it comes out every week. It's a weekly. Mm-hmm. And actually, I think there are two weeks of the year that it comes out. Uh, it skips a week and it's a double issue. So it's 50, 50 issues. Yeah. And, oh, my God, who can keep up with it? And yet it's so tempting because the covers are insanely beautiful. Mm-hmm. And the writing is just the best journalism out there today, in my opinion. And the stories they cover, for the most part, are just fascinating. So um, it's really hard for me, let me tell you, to not resubscribe. So I've decided that when I, when I have a, a New Yorker craving, I'm just going to go to the library. Yeah, that's fair. Sorry, New Yorker. Anyway. <sighs> but yeah, so uh, <laughs> then they discover that Miss Patty has left the uh, dance studio open, and they go inside. And, and they're concerned about it. Why would she yes. do that? Is she in there dead? They don't say that, but that's, <laughs> no. but that's the implication. Is she in there dead? Uh, but yeah, but they go in, and they end up falling asleep uh, in and- the studio. Wake up, little Susie. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
they w- they end up falling asleep. It's not a movie theater, but they do yeah. end up falling asleep. Anyway, and Miss Patty, uh, Miss Patty, and a group of uh, older women walk in in the at morning. So five a.m. Yeah, they come so in for a, an aerobics class at I, five a.m. Seriously, I mean, that does that does track though, because it's it's older women on the East Coast doing their aerobics in the morning. This makes perfect sense to me. I, I feel well, like the part that doesn't make sense is Miss Patty being up that early, but there is totally. And, oh yeah, she's teaching the class. Yeah. Because she she is herself like she's got to be three hundred pounds. I mean, we haven't mentioned this before. Miss Patty is a dance instructor who mm-hmm. weighs three hundred pounds and moves I mean, if so incredibly gracefully. Yeah, she it's, she's, she's just gorgeous. I mean, super it's just, graceful. It's, yeah. yeah, very graceful. Uh, but but yeah, but these these women come in and catch them, and uh, they're all simultaneously a little bit concerned, but clearly very happy for the gossip because they are seeing the well-known Rory Gilmore and the new boy who I, I think none of them know his name, but the, he's the new boy who works in Taylor's Market. Uh, and they have fallen asleep together, very clearly still wearing all of their clothes. Oh, like fully it's, dressed. Yeah, it's very it's clear. It's very innocent. I yeah. think they all realize that it's innocent. But yeah. Miss Patty also realizes, and I don't know if we, if we ever find out what Miss Patty's situation is, if she has children herself, but she knows that if, that if Lorelai wakes up and her daughter is not home, she's mm-hmm. going to panic mm-hmm. and be scared shitless. Mm-hmm. So she says, you guys got to get home. You guys, mm-hmm. Your parents are going to be worried. So yeah. um, they scramble. They move. They run home. They run home. And actually, uh, Rory runs home through, this, through the snow-covered street barefoot. She is mm-hmm. carrying her shoes in her hand. Uh, and she also insists that Dean not go with her. And she's not so much concerned about uh, her mother knowing that she's safe. And mm-hmm. she is about getting in trouble. Yeah. And her mother thinking that she's had sex mm-hmm. because this is a big issue for Lorelai. You know, yeah. I mean, she tries hard to, to push it to the back of her mind, but she got pregnant at 16. And by the way, this brings up a whole question for me that I was thinking about as I was watching this. Why didn't, and we don't have to address this now, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Why didn't Lorelai have an abortion? Yeah. Now, obviously, if she had, there would be no Rory. There would be no TV show. Mm-hmm. But why didn't she have one? Why wasn't has this never come up? Mm-hmm. And we can we can talk about that at a later time. But I just want to throw it out there. But because my first thought was, even if Rory gets pregnant, she can have an abortion. Her yeah. life is not over. Her life does not have to be Lorelai's. And not yeah. that Lorelai's life is over, but and she because she she's made a good life for herself despite mm-hmm. having a child of sixteen. But it's it's hard. It was has been hard from day one. So she's worried about her daughter doing that. I will say, obviously, uh, and I, I actually do think this is a pretty appropriate time to talk about this because I was thinking about this throughout this whole scene because uh, basically uh, before Rory gets home, Emily does wake up, which, a minor question, where did Emily sleep? Uh, in the chair, she <clears throat> says. She I fell guess. Asleep in the chair. She fell asleep yeah. in the chair? Okay. Um, but yeah, Emily wakes up and wakes up Lorelai, uh, and Lorelai is pretty disoriented, uh, and I gotta say, Emily is rough in this scene, but uh, this, I was wondering throughout this whole scene, or a, a part of me was thinking throughout this whole scene, like, you know, teens do have sex, and, like, birth control exists, abortion exists, and, like, the the practical answer is that this was marketed as a family-friendly sh- show, yeah, and at, exactly. this t- at this period, point in time... Culturally, we were not admitting that people had abortions, basically. I, I'm guessing that the network probably did not want them to talk about abortion at all. I, I don't know about the writers. I don't know if the writers ever wanted to bring that up as a topic or not. Well, it's kind of a fairy tale. I mean, it and, is, and yeah. if, if, you, if you think about these questions in a hard way, you have to accept that this is a fairy tale story. Mm-hmm. Because most 16-year-olds who have babies do not run away from home get a part-time job, work their way up to mm-hmm. manage uh, a business and have a successful parenting relationship with their child because they were a child themselves when, when the child was born. Mm-hmm. Most women who have babies at 16 do not experience the level of success yeah. that this woman has experienced. Do not raise a child who is going to go to Harvard or Yale. Mm-hmm. That, that, is, that is unrealistic. It's a fairy tale. And so what I kind of think they're doing here when they in the scene is they're kind of reinforcing that fairy tale you know that it happened 
or, or maybe they're questioning it because what they're what they're the question that's coming up is you did okay, you managed it okay, Lorelai, but can Rory do it? Because neither yeah. her mother or her grandmother thinks she'd be able to do it, and they don't want her to have to do it. So yeah. and and they, but also the fact that they jump to that that they yeah. both assume that she well I mean at first Lorelai doesn't but or at least doesn't let on that she has. But Emily immediately jumps to the assumption that mm-hmm. her granddaughter has had sex. Mm-hmm. And, we're, and, and, and probably because her daughter yeah. had this experience. So she, yeah. there's a reason behind it. It's a realistic assumption. But at the same time, she has gotten to know Rory. She has got to know that that's not the case. And even yeah. if she did have sex, so what yeah you know exactly if she gets pregnant i mean you have a bigger concern about stds than you yeah. do about pregnancy seriously so yeah. yeah i mean there there are layers happening here like you know obviously i do think that it would be horrifying as a parent to wake up and realize that your child had not come home like just on the basis that's of- the worst yeah. That is the most realistic thing about this scene. Yeah. I would have been scared shitless if you were supposed to be home at n- midnight and I woke up at 5.30 and you weren't there. How, a nightmare. That's a nightmare situation. Let it me is. Tell you. However, thanks to Miss Patty, Lorelai is only in that nightmare situation for about a minute. Because yeah, Miss Patty true. immediately <laughs> calls her and says that Rory is fine and is on her way home. Which bless I do just want to say, yes, bless her heart, Miss <laughs> Patty did the right thing. She knew. She knew yes. she needed to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So that worry is gone pretty quickly. Now, I do think yeah. that that would be a horrible way for Lorelai to wake up, especially with Emily like yelling in her face yeah Yeah. everything that emily says in this scene sucks like everything that she says to lorelei is just sucks so bad probably (laughs) it's probably a literal repeat of what she said Mm -hmm. to lorelei when she found out she was pregnant Mm -hmm. it's probably and and, and you can just see that in lorelei's face her mother is screaming at her how could you let this happen how could you how could my how could my granddaughter Mm -hmm. turn into my daughter she says some very hurtful things to lorelei in this scene and lorelei just stands there takes it but you can see in her face she's been here before this is this is the way her mother talked to her the first time when she found out lorelei was pregnant and even though we didn't see that we don't know what happened but we can see it in lorelei's face this is a yeah. repeat performance. Yeah. And yeah, she says, you're going to lose her just like I lost you. Uh, Rory's going to ruin her life. And then Lorelai says something that I think is very good and something that I wish Emily would actually hear, which is, look around, Mom. This is a life. Yeah. And that is kind of, you know, that is sort of at the at the core of this conflict, as well as their shared trauma over you know, Lorelai getting pregnant, part of this conflict is that Emily still does not accept that Lorelai's life isn't ruined. Lorelai's life is fine. It's great. It's a great life. That's the fairy tale element here. Yeah. Because in reality, she probably wouldn't have this life. Yeah, for sure. And and that keeps coming to my mind is that yeah it is a life and but it's a life that was created for you by your writers. I mean yeah. In in, in real life it probably in real life Emily would have been right. Mm-hmm. So um so I can see her concern but she doesn't handle it well. She no. just you know she just blows up. Mm-hmm. She and you know it, there's ang- and I realize that's anxiety. Um, it's fear and you know, she has all these hopes for her granddaughter that yeah. she also had had for her daughter yeah. and those were blown up uh, and, and, and she doesn't see her daughter yet she still doesn't see her daughter as a success yes. and it's probably never I can't remember if she ever actually does but so that's all coming up in this scene too she doesn't mm-hmm. see her as a success she doesn't really uh, credit anything that Lorelai has done with her life and in that conversation, Lorelai does defend Rory pretty hard, and Emily ends up leaving. Rory overhears the end of that conversation and enters into the kitchen thinking that Lorelai is going to be reasonable because she just heard Lorelai defending her. Mm-hmm. And instead, Lorelai turns around and tells her that she's insane, says she's going to put her on birth control, and just like blows up at her. And I think Rory's response is pretty good. Like, yeah. she, she does apologize. She apologizes for the right thing, which is making her mom worry because she was yeah. out. But she, like, correctly says that she didn't actually have sex and that the real reason that Lorelai is upset is because she made a mistake and Emily nailed her for it. 
And, and, and I think that is true, but I also think that Lorelai is also coming down off of the adrenaline yeah, for that sure. she experienced when she realized her daughter was not home at 5 a.m. So there's a fear factor there. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that exploded first, then the fight, uh, then you know, having to prove, having to uh, defend her, her daughter to her mother, who has always held her in, in judgment mm-hmm. and is now judging her daughter, too. That is yeah. all of that together. And, 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 and um, Rory's right. She is right about all of that. But she also is not being very compassionate to her mother, who has lived through an awful lot in this evening. <laughs> Lorelai is so, not giving her much of a chance to well, be, Well, she's though. not. And like I, I guess you know, I'm on the mom's side here. <laughs> I I do like I th- I think you're right about the adrenaline of how she woke up. I also think a lot of the adrenaline is just from yelling with Emily because that they, they just yeah. had a very. So I think yes. Lorelai is still just coming down from that fight. Yeah. But yeah. also, most of what Lorelai says in this scene is wildly unreasonable. It is like, unreasonable. The, the, she, she's she she may through it. She's thinking through the. She's uh, thinking through it, but most of what she's talking about is just the idea that Rory might have sex. And I'm sorry, teenagers do have sex, and it's not the end of the world. But just, she doesn't think it is. She doesn't think it's a horrible thing. She isn't judging her. She's worried about her future. She says she's going to put her on birth control pills. She's not saying you shouldn't have sex. She's not being a Christian. The, no, the you know the implication is that you shouldn't have sex. She says I'm going to put you on birth control like it's a threat. Like I do think that yes, like like I first of all I do think that birth control is a perfectly reasonable thing for a person to be on. But the way that Lorelai says it is like it's a threat and like Rory does not have a choice because Lorelai has determined that Rory has no self control and therefore must be prevented from doing this thing. And birth control is just the only way in that moment that she can do it. And I just feel like most of her language here, and I I get why it's happening because she, you know, she is afraid that a a repeat of what she went through is going to happen. But I, I feel like it does reflect a general trend sometimes in this show, implying that teenagers should not have sex and that the decision to have consensual sex with your boyfriend makes you a bad person. Uh, or means that you have like messed up in some kind of way and like yes in this moment I do think it would be kind of early for Rory and Dean to do that which is why they didn't Mm -hmm. Uh, but if they did that's not morally wrong if both of them consented to it but I think you hit on something a minute ago where you said the the the, uh, loss of self-control she's worried that she's a teenager who has lost self-control but where is that coming from because she, she, that is a self-reflection, a reflect, yeah. you know, reflection on herself. She still feels that as a teenager, she had no self-control. And she still feels bad about that. She, she has morally judged herself. Yeah. And has not come to realize that teenagers do things. Mm-hmm. Teenagers make mistakes. Sometimes they have sex. Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's a bad thing. Um, it, but it's a thing. It, it is mm-hmm. what it is. And it happens. And teenagers actually have... Uh, hormones that are out, you know, why can be wildly out of control. And are they expected not to act on that, you know, just because they're teenagers? So, yeah. and, and actually, you know, 500 years ago, teenagers were married and expected to oh, have yeah. babies. So it, it's, you know, um, biologically, it is a totally normal human response. So um, the self control thing, I think it's more about Lorelai than yeah. it is about Rory, because Lorelai has still not accepted her own. Uh, personality. She doesn't love herself sometimes. Yeah. And she she has never, I don't think she's ever forgiven herself, even though she does say this is a life. She's not truly ever forgiven herself, which is why she fails when she tries to defend herself to her mother. Yeah. I think it's also just that she, she hasn't been able to forgive herself, and I think she also cannot fully shut out Emily's voice. She can't. You know, no. It when Emily criticizes her, she takes that to heart, even when Emily is wrong, and she is wrong. They both are. I mean, Rory's right in this scene. This was a very, very painful uh, scene to watch, and it's the end of the movie. Talk about we had a hard opening, we got a mm-hmm. hard close. Mm-hmm. There is usually they usually come back, and there's a scene where they make up or mm-hmm. they're dancing, or there's something that happens. Nothing. It yeah. goes right to credits, and it was very difficult to watch that yeah. that's a that's the first time they've done this, this is episode nine first yeah. time they've done that with this show so it's a they're making a point yeah and this is 
going to continue into the next episode. Yeah. All right. So, well, final thoughts? Yeah. So my summary, these these difficult, mad, bad endings don't happen often in this show. Mm-hmm. So this is an important episode. And I think the their fears over Rory's whereabouts send both of their adrenaline through the roof, and it brings out all this old pain. Uh, and the sad thing about it is, is it's happened just when Emily and Lorelai seem to be headed in the right yeah. direction. They have found a good footing to be on. They've reestablished mm-hmm. their mother-daughter, their loving mother-daughter relationship. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, this is a pretty normal argument, really, for a mother and daughter to have. When you yeah. talk about whether or not you should have sex as a, as a 16 or 17-year-old, that is a very, and it's exactly the kind of argument, a discussion, that a mother and daughter should have, but Rory and Lorelai don't get to have it in a normal manner. They don't get to have it in private. They have it with, you know, the specter of <laughs> their mother uh, standing, you know, there yelling at her. But... It, just for example, I would have been in so much trouble if I had come in late. If I mm-hmm. if I had, was not in by the time my mother told me to be in. And that's because she was worried about my safety. She also was worried that I would get pregnant. So that was very much, that's a real deal. For I was never worried about that, about you. Mm. I, I was more worried about you getting in an accident or somebody killing you. <laughs> mm-hmm. that, that was those were my concerns. If you if you wanted to have sex, you would have talked to me about it. Uh, we would have gotten your birth control. I wasn't worried about that. And even if you had sex, you know, in, in, in a in a moment where it just happened and you got pregnant, mm-hmm. what would we have done? We, you would have gotten an abortion. So yeah. it, it's it wouldn't have been the end of the world, which it seems to be for these women because of the history. Yeah. So I think the fight between the younger girl Gilmore's is normal, a little out of control because of the adrenaline thing and what was happening mm-hmm. before. And, and I do feel like they're going to work through this, even though I can't remember what the next episode happens. But I think the Lorelai Emily fight is going to be much, much harder uh, to get through. Yeah, because it's the same fight that they've been having for 16 years. It is. It was like one step forward, two steps backwards. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> do you have any final thoughts? Uh, I mean, I guess my final thoughts are just that it's just very obvious to me that this is a network show from the early 2000s because of the Mm. inability to even discuss abortion as an option when, Mm. you know, it is it is very pertinent to the discussion that they're having. But for some reason, we can't talk about it. And if we were having this, this, if the show was on today, they would have this discussion. I would hope so. Yeah. Yeah, I think they would. I think it would be part of it. Um, they might still have these throwback, angry fights about whether whether or not teens should mm-hmm. be having sex. That's a whole different question. But but the re- the results and what happens as a result of of teen sexuality is is what's 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 happening in this scene and what would be happening in a show today. So yeah. Okay, so that, dear listeners, is all for today. Yeah, uh, I'm Tessa Dare. You can find me at my website, tessadare.com. That's T-E-S-S-A-D-A-I-R.com. Or you can sign up for my email list. Or you can follow me on Instagram at author.tess.adare. Or on TikTok at author.tess.adare. And I am Beth Von Baron. You can find me on Instagram at STL underscore writer underscore Beth. Or follow me on Facebook at Beth Von Baron STL for St. Louis. This has been Where You Lead, our fun and terribly witty podcast about the Gilmore <laughs> Girls from the perspective of a mother and daughter. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. And we'll tune in for our next episode in two weeks. See you then. Uh-huh.